You are listening to the podcast of New Life Church in Wayland, Michigan. Our longing is to see zero people in our community living unchanged by Jesus. We are a church navigating the messiness of life together in community. One of our core convictions is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. I hope you know there is a place in the family for you here. For more information on gathering times and location, check out our website. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through this word. On the first day of the festival, on unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make the preparation for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Surely I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after another, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to, his, gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink from it, new with you in my Father's kingdom. Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Nice sunny morning, isn't it? Um, my name is Robert Rokis, as you guys might know. Um, I've noticed a few new faces here today, and I really like to see that here. Um, so I'd like to start off saying I'm a teenager. I like to mess around and stuff. I disobey my parents. I do stupid stuff with my friends that my parents wouldn't be proud of me to do. Um, as one time, like last year, me and my friends were roaming around the town doing stupid stuff. Um, I didn't really think any of it until they started climbing on school buildings. And I was like, would my parents really approve of that? Would they, what would they think if they seen me do that? I don't think they would be proud of me to see me do that. I would like to start off saying uh, this year at camp, was the, the theme was the road for Jesus, how he had to choose the road of obedience or diso- disobedience. Jesus could have chose to go down one road while God told him to go down the other. He could have chose to go right or left. He could have stayed when God told him to go. At camp, we talked about a few specific stories from Jesus' life where he showed obedience to God's will. Some of our students just acted that out, as you could see. This story can be found in Matthew 26, 17 through 29, if you want to flip to your Bibles to that. In this story, Jesus ushered in the covenant the new covenant. The disciples asked Jesus where he wanted to eat the Passover meal. He told them to go into the city and tell a man that they were going to have their Passover meal at his house. So the disciples did what Jesus asked, asked, and they prepared the Passover. Jesus was eating dinner with the disciples, and while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples got all worried and started freaking out, saying, Jesus, you can't be talking about me. Finally, Judas said, You don't mean me, Jesus, do you? Fi- meaning Judas was... Dang it. And Jesus said, You have said it, meaning Judas was the one who would betray him later. Even despite having this hard conversation, despite Jesus thinking about this man that he invested three years into betraying him, despite the fact that he knew Judas was going to hand him over to the chief priests and elders, Jesus still brought in the new covenant. You see, there was the old covenant that the Israels uh, were living under. They had to make animal sacrifices for all their sins. There were 613 laws that they had to follow. If they broke one, they would have to make a sacrifice to an animal to cover all their sins. 
However, Jesus brought in the new covenant with the shedding of his own blood. The new covenant that would cover all sins. There would be no more animal sacrifices. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. He covered all of humanity's sins forever. Right after telling Judas he would, he would betray him, Jesus tells his disciples to eat the bread, which represents the body, and to drink the wine, which represented his blood, the new covenant. It would have been so easy for Jesus to not bring in the new covenant. It would have been so easy to be frustrated with the human, humanity, to be frustrated with people like Judas, who would betray him. It would have been so easy to say, I'm done with these people. They're not going to listen. They're just going to keep on making mistakes. They're not going to listen to me. But he did not. He chose obedience to the Father and chose to usher in the new covenant between God. Today, we are going to remember the new covenant as a church. Today, we are going to celebrate this by taking communion together. As I read tw Matthew 26, 26 through 29, remember that Jesus had you in mind when he was ushering in this new covenant. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We have a station up in the front and up in the back. There is gluten-free available if you need it. When you grab the elements, you can take them to your seat and eat and drink when you're ready. But church, won't you come forward and take communion and remember the new covenant made by Jesus' blood? Let's pray together, then you come forward. Jesus, we thank you for your obedience to the Father. We thank you that you chose to bring the new covenant so we can live freely in you. We thank you for the sacrifice you made for us. We pray a blessing over this time that we could remember you as we receive communion today. We love you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come forward and remember what Jesus did for you. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and then he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons, James and John of Zebedee, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little far farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray so that you would not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed th a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Hi, my name is Esri. I am 12 years old. I'm a student here at New Life, and I'm going to be talking about the next part of today's message. M many of you are probably familiar with the name Corrie ten Boom. Corrie ten Boom was born April 15, 1892, during World War II. Corrie ten Boom and her family helped hide Jews in their house until they could get to safety. One day, the ten Boom family got caught trying to hide Jews in their home and were separated. Corrie and her sister Betsy were taken to a concentration camp in Germany. Even while Corrie was at the concentration camp, she was still doing God's will by helping other families by taking care of their kids so their parents could get some rest and telling other people about the Bible to anyone who would listen in their hut. A day came when she got a letter that said that all the Jews that were hiding in her house had escaped. Cory was thrilled, but there was also some heartbreaking news. Her father had died. A few months later, her sister died. Even though Cory was going through all of this, she still trusted the Lord and knew that he would take care of her. 
Not long after her sister died, she was released from the concentration camp. Corey had assigned papers that said she Corey had assigned papers before she could go that says she was treated very well in the camp. Even though we all know she, every even though we all know everyone there was treated very poorly. At her release, Corey Ten Boom was so sick that she had to go straight to the hospital. When Corey got out of the hospital, she opened up a home for other victims of the war to come for hope, help, and peace. Despite how she had been treated, she used her life and gifts to help others. Corrie ten Boom died April, four, April 15, 1983, on her birthday. Corrie lived a life worth being recognized and honored. She is famous for saying, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. We can all know someone who, just like Corrie ten Boom, and even more of a hero came to save not only the Jews, but all of us from our sins. The next story we're going to be talking about, as you just watched our students perform, is how Jesus was obedient to death. Not just any death, but a brutal, torturous, uncomfortable, and painful death. Before he was betrayed and turned over to the chief priest, he went to the Father in prayer. Jesus went to Gethsemane with his disciples. When, when they got there, he told his disciples to sit while he went elsewhere in prayer. He took with him Peter, James, and John. He started to be troubled and told the three disciples to sit and keep watch while he went, while he continued. Jesus kept going and then fell face down to the ground and prayed that the Father would let his cup pass, meaning Jesus knew he was going to be put to death in the most brutal way, but he made sure to also pray for the Father's will to be done, not his own. Jesus prayed this prayer three times while he was there. Jesus knew what his death was going to be like. He knew his Father's plan. He begged the Father for another way out, but in the end of it all, Jesus wanted the Father's plan, wanted the Father's plan more than his, for his life, more than his own comfort. Paul beautifully writes about this idea in Philippians 2 when he says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus was mocked. He was tortured. He was spit on. He was stripped. He was insulted when he was put to death. Jesus knew this was going to happen to him when he was put to death on the cross. He also knew this was his Father's will. Jesus loved us enough to be obedient to death, to, the, to be obedient to the Father and die on the cross for each and every one of us. We can learn from what Jesus did on the cross. He went to whatever lengths possible to, to, to fulfill the Father's will for his life. He was so obedient that he would die if God told him to. It's very difficult to want what someone else wants when it goes against what you want. I have experienced this in, my, this in a very hard way in my own life very recently. Before my great-grandma died of, of, from pneumonia about five months ago, my family and I prayed for her a lot for God to heal her, especially me. It was about a week after my birthday party, the last time I saw her. I was very close to her. Every Wednesday, we, went, we would go over to her house and share a meal that we had brought. I even shared the same middle name. I always look forward to seeing her every week. On Saturday, my grandma called me, my mom, to tell her the news that my great grandma had gone to the hospital with pneumonia on that night before. Every single day after I heard she was in the hospital, I would be praying for her to be another way out for her besides death. On Monday morning, things seemed to get better for her. She was up and out of bed and doing some physical exercise, and we started to have hope. We called her later that afternoon, and she answered in the most happiest voice I ever heard. Monday was a blessing, but Tuesday made everything go downhill from there. My grandma called, telling my mom that my grandpa and herself were com going to come home from Florida because things did not look great in the hospital. My great-grandma passed away the next day on March 9. She died in her sleep. My great-grandma had wanted to go see Jesus, but her entire family wanted her to get better and not go. 
It's very hard to respect that. She wanted to go to heaven. It's very hard to have to say goodbye as well and not want to have to. I love my great-grandma very much. I not want her to die, but there was not my choice whether she lived or not. But I'm glad she's in heaven today. Just a quick question for you to think about. You may have heard the story about Jesus dying on the cross for your sins as long as you can remember. But have you ever wondered what you would do if you were to be put in Jesus' spot? What you would do if you were if you had to go through all of this to save the world from their sins, even the people who were putting you to death, how would you feel? Things were pretty tough from Jesus' point of view. Life isn't always going to be perfect, just like we want it to be. It wasn't that way from the start. We're all going to face trials in our lives. Some people might face hunger, some health issues. Some people might have to go through a divorce, and some losing a loved one. We'll all face challenges just like Jesus, and we'll all have to, the choice to trust God through it all, even when it seems impossible to, for anything to ever go right again. But we will all have to remember to do God's will and trust him. I want to close my time by just giving everyone a few moments to pray this prayer. I want to give us time to lay down our motives, our own plans, our own desires, and say, Lord, what do you want for me? God, I want your will for my life, and I want to walk in obedience to you, even if I have to give up my own desires. Take a few moments to talk with God. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the, the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Don't be afraid, for Jesus is... For you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings! They came to him, collapsed his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest that everything that had happened. When the chief priest had met them with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story had been widely circulated amongst the Jews to this very day. The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you, always, to the very end of the age. Hey, Brad. All right, well, I just want to say congratulations to everybody in that skit. I did not have high hopes, I'm going to be honest. But... <laughs> But that was way better than I expected, so good job. All right, so some of you may know me, some of you may not. So if you don't know me, my name is Lorelai, and I will be giving the third and last portion of today's message. I'm sorry, I'm very nervous right now, so. Right. Woo. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> All right, so let's go over what we've talked about this morning. We've talked about Jesus' obedience to the new covenant that we now live under. We've also talked about Jesus being obedient to the Father's will that led him to his own very death. Finally, we're going to talk about Jesus being so obedient to come back to earth, the same place where he was just murdered at, to, to send out disciples. Jesus' mission on earth was finished. He saved us from our own sin with his death. He was the ultimate sacrifice. We no longer lived under the old covenant. It's 600 million thousand laws. I, I couldn't tell you any of them. But with his death, the new one. It even says in the Bible, in John 19, 30, while Jesus is hanging there on the cross, he utters the words, it is finished. The work was done. He lived the perfect life. 33 years of life, three years of intense ministry, training 12 disciples. Jesus had finished what he came to do. Jesus was able to be in heaven with his father once again. He had finished his mission on earth of, with dying on the cross. But once again, Jesus was so obedient to what the father wanted, he came back to earth to send out disciples to do ministry. Now, when you think about it, Jesus' last days were a really hard time, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Physically, they beat him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They forced him to carry his cross across the city. They put nails through his hands and his feet. They stabbed him. They left him to hang there to die. Mentally, he was betrayed by the people he called his closest friends. Spiritually, he had to take on the weight of everyone's sin. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think the weight of everyone's sin is a pretty light weight. No offense. <laughs> Jesus had came back to the place he was just murdered at. That is crazy. That's like getting beat up in an alleyway and showing it to your friends the next day. Like, hey guys, this is the alleyway I got beat up in. Pretty cool, isn't it? Who does that? That was a rhetorical question. Please do not raise your hands. Cam, patience, put your hands down. <laughs> Most people, it takes them years to return to someplace traumatic. But, well, sorry, I just messed up. It's fine. <laughs> Most, yeah. It takes them years to return to someplace traumatic. I know for me, when I was younger, I would ride my bike a lot. But if I got hurt on my bike, I practically refused to go on it for a couple days. I was too nervous. But not Jesus. Jesus got right back on his bike. He came back once again. He came back to the same humanity that had betrayed him and beaten him, that had put him to death. He came back to humanity to send out disciples. Jesus set the example throughout his entire life to be obedient. We've just barely scratched the surface today. But if you open up your Bibles, you will see Jesus' obedience to the Father all throughout. And so, church, I have a challenge today. What is the Lord asking of you? Where is he directing you to go? Who is he asking you to talk to? Won't you follow in the example of Jesus and be obedient to God's prompting in your life? All right, well, I'd like to invite up Brad to talk real quick, but my name is Lorelai. It's been a pleasure to be up here, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Can we uh, just take a moment to thank all of the students and leaders that did this today? So my wife and I, uh, Sam, who is right here, we had the opportunity to be in student ministry for nearly a decade. And student ministry is really, really near and dear to our hearts. Student ministry is a priority for our church. In fact, as, as I read the psalm that Sam read earlier, Psalm 145, this is what it says. It says, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation, commend your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. Here's what this psalm is saying. It's saying that if you are part of the family of God, you are carrying a torch. You're carrying a baton, if you will. And the challenge and the question is, is what are you doing to pass that torch on? Parents, in your families, what are you doing to pass the torch on to, to your kids? And I'm reminded that like our culture is pretty hostile to faith. Like they're not gonna have that torch passed on through watching Netflix. They're not gonna have that torch passed on for the most part through their schools. It's, it's through you. This is through us. 
adults in the church without kids, what are you doing to pass the torch of faith on to younger people in our church? See, see, here's what's easy, and here's what our culture will tell you. We'll, we'll look at young people, and we'll say, well, they're, they're not my kids. They're not my responsibility. Not so in the church. Our young people, our, our kids, our students, they are all of our responsibility to walk with parents, to encourage them, and to pass that torch on to the next generation. And so if you're here this morning, maybe you're newer to New Life over the last couple months, I want to encourage you, if God is tugging on your heart to disciple and to walk with students, I can tell you from personal experience, there are few greater places to serve in the church where you see more fruit and are filled up more as a volunteer than student ministry, than kids ministry, than pouring into and discipling younger people. It's beautiful. I think of Avery, one of our students at the church I was at, who is now a leader in the youth group at our church. I think of weddings that I get to do of students who are faithfully following Jesus, not students getting married like they grew up and a few years later I did their weddings. We don't do student weddings here. Uh, but it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing when you get to pour into the lives of a young person and see them following Jesus and running after him with their lives. No greater joy than that. And so here's what I want to do. I want to invite up anybody who is serving our students, any adult who is serving our students, any volunteer, any, uh, Josh, I would love to invite you up as well. But I just want to, these are absolute heroes. I don't know if they knew I was going to have them come up, but... <laughs> Yeah, so if you guys want to just stand on the stage with me here. You know, I look at this group, and, and there's quite a few more. I think some of them will be here during second service, but um, I cannot thank you guys enough for what you do on a weekly basis. Um, you know, meeting students here late last night to decorate this place and go crazy, um, hosting mess nights and color wars at your house, um, running discipleship groups for students. Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you guys for what you do. I want to just spend a moment praying over our leaders, praying for this next school year for our students that starts, yes, in a few weeks. Nobody wants to think about that. Um, and uh, just honoring you guys for everything you do to serve and love our students. So let's, let's pray for these leaders. If you don't mind, just extend a hand towards them. Father, I thank you for these leaders. Student ministry is not the easiest ministry to serve in. Our young people are navigating some pretty heavy stuff. And uh, God, they're faithful. Like these leaders show up week in and week out and, and pour into and disciple our students and love them through hard conversations and cheer them on and, and go to plays and, and sporting events, God, and go visit them at work and just give their lives to these students and to loving them. And so, God, we thank you for their investment. We thank you for their faithfulness. We thank you for their love. And God, we thank you that our students are able to see you through their example. And so God, I pray for this coming year. I pray for um, Josh and Olivia specifically. God, we thank you for the blessing of, of their new baby girl, Avery. And I, I pray for them as, as they lead this ministry over this next year, God, that, that you will turn your favor towards them, that you will bless this ministry, that, that they will see new students come and new students filled and new students experiencing your love and your mercy and your transformation as a result of their ministry. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you that you are here and that you are moving and that you are present and you have not abandoned us. You are here right now with us. And so God, this morning we gather to worship you, to lift your name high. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen.